right, welcome everyone to uh, this SPX panel, Color and Narrative Innovation. Uh, I am your moderator, Rob Clown, and I have a number of esteemed guests with me here. Um, starting gallery wise, for me right next to me is the one and only Mari Naomi. Uh, and she's done all sorts of comics uh, and many people may know her best for her black and white work, but we're today going to talk about what she did in her excellent YA series, uh, Life on Earth, um, three-part series published by Graphic Universe. And then right below me, we have Tilly Walden, uh, and who also started out black and white, later single tones. I remember even talking to her kind of earlier, it's like, so what about you in color? And she thought, hmm. And she was she was already in the midst of, of experimenting. Um, she has a new collection of her earlier work out from Avery Hill called Alone in Space. But uh, today we'll be focusing on the work she did in uh, On a Sunbeam, but in particular, Are You Listening? Which I thought was an extremely interesting use of color. Uh, then next to her is Shira Spector, who has a brand new book from Fanographics called Red Rock Baby Candy. And in this particular use of color, it's super bright, vivid, and psychedelic. And I'm fascinated by, uh, um, make, I'll make sure your pronouns is, uh, are you she, her? She, yeah, she, her is fine. So we'll double check. And then finally, we have Dash Shaw, whose new book, Discipline, from New York Review Comics, is in black and white, but he has done some nutty experiments with color, um, including and especially the book I want to focus in on is um, New School, but also a lot of um, short stories. Um, and uh, one of the ones I thought was most interesting and we'll get to uh, was um, <clears throat> uh, Satellite CMYK which was one of his big breakthroughs in that regard. And I think we will actually start there. Uh, Dash, I remember when you had a gallery show at Duke uh, well over a decade now, I think it may have been your, I think it was your first big show. Um, you actually asked me the question, so who in comics do you see using color in sort of an innovative or interesting um, or non-typical way and we thought about it and we couldn't come up with a very long list at that time. It was like, well, Chris Ware, but, and then beyond that, there wasn't a lot. And then next thing I see when you're working in um, the anthology Moam, you're starting to use uh, color in a very interesting way. So um, I wanted to open up with Satellite CMYK and that's a story about, um, life on this satellite where every level was um, color coded in a different way. So there are multiple narratives and then the different levels had like completely different environments and cultures and things like that. So uh, I'm interested in sort of your journey in color and how you, and sort of how you, you got there and why a, a not an atypical or innovative use of color was so appealing to you. Yeah, um, you know, in the 90s, it really felt like most alternative comics were black and white because of, uh, because, because it was, because of the printing, you know, and, um, and the color you'd see would, would either be kind of like the Chris Ware, Tintin school of coloring, where it's like, um, maybe the time of day, you know, like naturalistic, naturalistic light. So like, from the line art, you could tell there was a tree and but the, it would be colored like brown, like the bark of the tree, but the tint of the brown would kind of suggest the time of day, um, naturalistic coloring. And then there was like, a, you know, rubber blanket and silk screen comics where there are two colors combining to make a third color. Um, but it seemed like there wasn't um, a lot around then when I was like, especially when I was a student at SVA that where, where it was color that was adding um, meaning or content. And it wasn't just like a supportive element um, so like satellite CMYK, it was also, you know, kind of probably obviously, um, happened to align, not happen, but, 
um, would not have been possible without um, uh, the internet and posting things online for color costing just as much as, as posting something in black and white. Um, but the, the uh, satellite CMYK and some of those things were like, how could color be, be meaningful and add content to the comic and not just be a supportive element? And so there was like color coding things and um, things that were like in new school and my entire high school singing in the sea with Tran and Moam, where it would be like kind of um, almost um, almost abstract expressionist paintings that would kind of align with the line art in an unusual way. Um, so it was it was um, kind of trying to puzzle puzzle it out and and um, have it be um, an integral integral part of it. Uh, yeah, and and that was definitely true because you really hit on even some people who later use color, you could remove the color from a lot of people's comics and it would not visibly alter uh, the narrative or the understanding of the comic, um, which on the face of it is sort of like, you know, why is it there? And for a lot of people, it's sort of like just um, it's filling in space. It's so it's you know removing negative space, and that's that's certainly a use. But for that particular short story, if there wasn't color in it, it would have been completely unintelligible as a story. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could still understand what was happening in a Chris Ware comic, but um, I think it would it would definitely remove um, the naturalism or kind of the because you know the way he draws is so like borderline, especially then like abstract shapes, very like clip art-y, but the, the color was like a real, a real day, or, you know, a real time, like the sun setting and stuff like that. And tin, I mean, Tintin, of course, the colors are incredible in Tintin. Right, and um, there, I mean, there's, there's certainly, there's vividness and balance and things like that. And these people certainly understand the way colors interact but it's all still secondary to the line and the, the thing i was fascinated by a lot of your comics is that color isn't secondary to the line and i think uh i will go ahead and move and we'll we're gonna come back to dash and talk more about new school um because one of the things i'm interested with color is the way it can advance um, the emotional narrative of a story as opposed to just the narrative events. And in uh, Red Rock Baby Candy, your color, use of color is like, um, almost feels like emotional bursts on the page. Um, it's, it's the emotional equivalent of like exclamation marks on some of your page. Uh, how did you approach color for this book? And, um, I'm curious about um, your your comics background and art background with regard to your understanding and use of color. Good question. It all connects. Um, so when I started writing Red Rock Baby Candy, it was like 11 years ago and I was not known and I was very concerned about how much things cost. And I read somewhere that you shouldn't, you should work in black and white if you want to be published. And so that was my limitation that I imposed on myself. And then I did that for years and years. And it really taught me to, because uh, color is everything to me, but working in black and white sort of explained color to me and explained the color in black and white. It, 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 was, it was really illuminative. Illuminative, that's not even a word. It was illuminating. Um, anyway, then color crept in slowly because I thought, well, it'll be okay. I'll just use a little bit of color. And I used it highly symbolically. And then I kept going until eventually I couldn't stand it anymore. And I think that's where that sort of, that's, that tonality comes from, that like loudness, because I was like, it's really needed to, to let loose with all of that color. For me, color is vibration and it's pleasure. And it's, you know, sometimes I think about what color I, this sounds flaky, but I wake up in the morning and I'm like, what color do I want to project today? And I'll just feel like it's blue, it's blue, you know, that's the color of, of today. And, and so I dress that way. And for me, it's, it's all sort of interconnected. I also come from a textile background. And so for me, color and texture, fabric, juxtaposition, um, a, a lot of my influence, I think, was quilt making and crazy quilts. And so 
the pattern texture it's all it's all wrapped in there for me so it, i don't think i made a distinction i was just like i'm going to treat this comic like a quilt and that makes complete sense because uh quilts i mean quilts traditionally often are meant to tell a story as well mm -hmm. they're panels um uh it's the you know often it's it's a family story where there's these kinds of images and so there's an intuitive sense of like we're combining color and pattern and storytelling and it's all the same thing and on your pages you've got um it it flips in and out between traditional page layouts open page layouts and then just like this big bursts of color um and yeah that that makes complete sense that it's uh it's another way of thinking about um word image story texture together also hidden narratives i mean in quilt making a lot of a lot of they were the they were the narratives of women predominantly and uh so as you know as a dyke and as a woman and bringing sort of all of that to to that work i think that's that's significant in terms of where sort of what I'm thinking about all the time, um, the, the narrative of color and its own sort of trajectory and its own power and all of that. Yeah, that's an interesting point because especially, you know, historically when women weren't like encouraged to like write their own narratives down on paper. Right, right. it was subverted into their textiles and into their drawings and into their embroideries. And so there, it, that tradition really feels behind me and part of what I'm doing. Um, and also I'm, you know, extremely overt so I feel like I'm sort of pulling that forward and yeah, I'm playing yeah. with a lot of things. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. Uh, Tilly, so um, you're someone, as I said, someone who started in black and white and um, whose line work, especially dr drawing buildings, which I knew is, all, is always your favorite thing to draw. Um, uh, but every time you did something new, you added in a new comic, you added something technique wise. Um, you just sort of, sort of this on this curve up or every time you, you, you it's like you, you seem to challenge yourself to do something new. Um, so I want to start with on a sunbeam and what what drew you to color? What was your understanding of color? Had you used it much in cartooning before? Um, had you done much painting? Um, because one of the things I noticed immediately was that uh, a it was ex it was exquisite, and B the balance was remarkable. That was that was I think a little bit of luck. I I've never formally studied color. I didn't. My art classes that I had in high school were were my foundation uh, at, a, at a public school in Texas, and then I went to the Center for Cartoon Studies. I just didn't I didn't go to a traditional art school, and we didn't really have any classes in color. Um, and so I knew, I knew I'd have to figure it out mostly, at least initially, because I thought that I'd have to work in color. If it was totally up to me, I think actually all my work would be black and white. Um, but someone came in at some point was like, to market your book, make it in color. Um, and I was like, okay, well, and I'm, I'm glad in a way that I started working in color, even though it didn't come naturally to me, because I do think I found something in there, but I started off by just using only purple for like two years and that was how I started learning color and when I got to on a sunbeam I had I had used purple and yellow I, I had added in yellow when I did spinning and I was like okay you've used two colors now's the time to like try to figure out how to use multiple colors um and it was really really daunting and I'm I'm surprised that it ended up working out in on a sunbeam every comic I've done it's like you said I use it as an opportunity to try to learn a new skill um, because it takes you're doing so many pages if you're going to do something 400 times you're gonna figure it out somehow or you're gonna figure out something um, and with sunbeam it it really was methodical I just started off and added a new color in each chapter um, and I think I don't know how it was that that I found the balance with it. I've always had just kind of a keen compositional eye. So I think I could notice when it's like, ah, that red is like too red, that pink doesn't work with that blue. 
and that sort of thing. But I really, I really just relied on my instinct. And after you've done like 200 pages and you've added in a color each time, the original version of Sunbeam was 700 pages long. So there was no way I wasn't going to figure it out um, with that much time. And it was only after on a Sunbeam that I think I actually started, I just began to learn how to use color intentionally. All of on a Sunbeam felt like I was like groping in the dark. Uh, it's like waking up without my glasses on. Um, it was guesswork, but it was lucky guesswork. And, and now I've been able to kind of evolve beyond that and like actually think about what a color means. Why should I put it here? What's the deal with light? Still figuring that one out. And uh, we'll come back to that with Are You Listening, where use of color is extremely deliberate um, for, and especially as I have sort of touched on before, the, um, the emotional narrative of the yeah. story. Um, Mari, uh, thank you for joining us. It's, it's always lovely to, to talk to you. And, uh, and again, uh, I know that you have a background as a painter and um, as among cartoonists, you've switched up technique as much or more than anyone I've ever seen <laughs> from like, um, I've seen your early work. I know like your sort of dense naturalistic work, I've seen it. Um, and then a lot of your work is like extremely spare, sparse, but almost always, but your, your painting was one world, your comics are another world, but, um, in life, life on life on Earth, um, you really uh, you change it up with terms of color, and um, uh, briefly, it's a story about um, a bunch of high schoolers who sort of have these tense, complicated interpersonal relationships, and someone they know um, not all that well. She was kind of an outsider disappears and um when she comes back there's this, this odd suspicion that like was she captured by aliens what strange thing happened to her and throughout the book um you've got your various each character is drawn and has a font that is particular then that reflects each individual's different point of view um in terms of color. And then when we finally get to the, the girl who comes back and her point of view, um, Mari absolutely goes ham on those pages and use of <laughs> color to, to tell the reader something weird has happened without telling the reader something weird has happened. Um, please, uh, uh, go, why, uh, why this approach was the fact that, you know, you, someone else was publishing your book were you encouraged to use color or you were like, Ooh, I get to experiment with color because someone else is publishing my book. Well, um, let's see when for, so for the longest time in like in the nineties, I was doing just black and white because that's, you know, what was available to me. Like everyone says, like, you know, I was photocopying stuff at work maybe. And, um, and, and, and yeah, color was always re uh, reserved for my paintings. And when I was invited um, to do a full color comic, I think it was for Rob Kirby's queer anthology. Uh, I didn't know what the hell to do. Sorry, heck to do. Um, because I've been working in black and white. So <laughs> um, black and white so long and, and it was I was so compartmentalized that I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'll just use all the colors. And I, I it was like a 15 page story, I think, um, that I did entirely in watercolor and I treated it like a painting and it took me so long to do because I was essentially drawing the same comic like 20 times, however many colors I have in there. And I thought, wow, I, I shouldn't use color because this is too hard, but it looked so beautiful that I, I wanted to do it again. I just, you know, wanted to have nine lives to do it in. And so I went back to black and white for a while with like the occasional splash of color for like really, really short stories. But also in publishing, you're more likely to get published if it is black and white as far as, you know, what's easy, what's cheaper to print. Like I, right now, my agent does have a, a, a book that actually I showed you, Rob. It's, it's full color and that's actually a hindrance to getting it published because it's so expensive to print. It's, it's like an art book. 
and uh, so, you know, if I, if I, if I, I was told for this uh, young adult series that I should probably stick to black and white. Um, and when I finally got a publisher for it, I was like, well, what if I add one color here? And uh, <laughs> would, would, could we maybe just do this one color? Okay, what, what about, what if I added a different color for each person? Just spot colors, really small. And they're like, well, let's check our budget. And let's see what we could do. And so I was kind of pushing the envelope because I really did want to add color. Um, I, I felt that the narrative kind of needed it uh, because to me, um, uh, spoiler alert, the colors represented each person's aura. And uh, so they were, you know, one person is purple, one is yellow. And then when you get to the mystery character, um, I won't give too much away, but like she kind of sees all and she's, she's, she's seeing all the colors. And it's kind of a take on what I've long thought of. Uh, there is no such thing as black and white in life. It's all nuance. It's all shades of gray. Well, what if we add color to that too? Like shades of color is such a broader spectrum you know that's that's the uh, angle I was coming from and I think it did help uh, that I wasn't doing the whole book in colors from a publishing perspective because it wasn't as expensive and you know they had to really uh, figure out you know how many pages is in color like that you know that really affects like the printing costs uh, so that's but but yeah it's from a creative perspective. I, I like the idea of pushing the boundaries and uh, getting away with as much as I could um, to tell the story I wanted to tell. How satisfying was it? Because your use of color, I mean, I was looking, I saw and I noticed, I could see what you were doing, but it was also subtle. You weren't like whacking the reader over the head with it um, until you got to mystery character where it was clear that you know, how satisfied was it to get to that point and how satisfied were you with the results of like kind of culminating in that and uh, something that like proved to be not just a special effect, but like kind of the turning point in the whole book with regard to like all the conflicts of the characters. It felt great. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the second so w one thing from a from a technical perspective, um, I only very recently started drawing digitally on on the iPad, and uh, mm. so when I was doing the color for book two with a special character where where you're going haywire or the color that was all color pencil, and I will never do that again. Mm. Uh, good God, it was just uh, just. I mean, it was, first of all, it's very hard. You can't use an eraser for color pencil, apparently. Uh, and let alone an undo, my God, it was it was just a nightmare. Every, like, I'm like, okay, I, I have to sit down and I can't make any mistakes, which is the ultimate nightmare, which is kind of fun too, because you know sometimes mistakes would get in there and I'm like, oh, that actually adds and I'll go a different direction with this page. But there were a lot of pages where I'm like, oh no, I have to start again. So yeah, I know on deadline, it sucks. Uh, so so there was that aspect to it, but I, I thought it turned out beautifully. And then I had to scan it and like, just everything gets lost when you scan something like that. Mm -hmm. it's sad. So, uh, so on book three, I, I between book two and book three, I purchased an iPad and an Apple Pencil. Um, this is not an endorsement for Apple, but I do like mm -hmm. the iPad and Apple Pencil. And and I spent months just trying to figure out how to make it look as close to real as possible. Like I didn't want to look, it to look digital at all. I mean, it's, it's fine. Like certain, actually certain chapters do look digital and that was intentional. Like I, like I wanted to look digital when it's digital, but when I was copying the color pencil style, like I just, I just spent so much time saying, okay, how can I make this look as randomized like it as possible? And, um, and so yeah, book, two was done with uh, entirely on paper and book three was done on an iPad as far as the color sections go. And that was so much easier. Oh, so much better. And I, I, I did suddenly have just all like, I didn't, I wouldn't say I had more time because I had a much shorter deadline and it was very stressful, but it was, it was less stressful in that 
like I could erase. <laughs> Such a huge deal. Uh, sorry, I think I digressed. <laughs> no, that's fine. And actually, I'm I'm very curious about that in terms of like the actual application of the color technique. Um, what challenges have each of you kind of faced in figuring that out? And do you do you prefer working with paints, colored pencils, markers, or do you prefer working digitally? And how does each work for you? And we'll start with Tilly on that. I hate, I don't like working digitally. And I, I did Sunbeam digitally and mostly for time because I had this dream that I would make a web comic and I would publish it a chapter a week, 20 to 40 full color pages a week. Why not? That's not crazy. Um, and I had a little bamboo tablet, um, but I never installed the driver software. So it was just a mouse. And I colored all of Sunbeam on that. And I also didn't know how to use multiple layers. So it was like one layer and like fill bucket. So it was like a, from, a, from a printing perspective and like a, a digital knowledge perspective, it was an absolute catastrophe. And when I did Are You Listening, again, for time, I did it digitally. I installed the software and I learned how to use multiple layers. And I, I found this overlay thing that I'd never seen. I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, overlay, darkening. Um, but in a perfect world, I would, I enjoy coloring with a mixture of marker and watercolor, which is how I colored my tarot deck. Um, I like doing a layer of watercolor, a layer of marker, and then like another layer of watercolor, and then maybe some colored pencil for Zazz. Um, if I could do a whole book like that, I'd need like five years, but no one wants to give me five years. Uh, but that's, that's the dream. What do you, what do you like about that effect? I like, uh, I like the permanence of it. I like that. I, it, all these random constraints show up. Like when I was doing the tarot deck, the marker that I wanted to use ran out of ink. And so I ended up using other colors unexpectedly. Um, and I really like what happens on paper when you, when you layer media, especially kind of crappy paper, when it kind of fizzes out and creates kind of like a dappled effect. Uh, Cause I generally use kind of crappy paper. Um, I just like, I like that uh, things happen unexpectedly. And I like that I can't check my email on my markers. <laughs> An excellent point. Uh, Cher, what about you? Yeah, I'm not digital. I don't even know how to be digital. And I don't really have much interest. I'm also so infatuated with paper and uh, materials that I can touch. I'm really tactile. And I guess there's stuff I don't really understand about, like you're talking about it. And I'm like, well, that sounds vaguely interesting. Um, so I, you know, I speak from, from a place of ignorance about digital possibilities but for me it's all about what I can get my hands into and I everything feels like fair game to me I start with Bristol paper and ink uh, which I treat like watercolor and then I've used crayons and crayons are awesome because they're like a resist so then that's kind of like bringing a fabric technique in and yeah I've dug into the paper I love that what happens when mistakes happen and you have to fix them because they have to be fixed because there's nowhere to go there's no layer to undo um yeah, I also use colored pencil. Um, I'm kind of at this place right now where I'm like anything that I can jam into my scanner is fair game. So like I'm looking at anything that's like three dimensional that won't like scratch or break the thing and just trying to sort of bring as much of, of everything to to my work. That's my new that's my new toy. <laughs> uh, 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 mixed media and that you can kind of you can really see that in your work and um it's fascinating that you're using sort of this um, old tradition, this hidden tradition, and you're using it in the same way that like a lot of modern art use mixed media, like like Robert Rauschenberg and people like that. And you're like, this that's nothing new. Yeah. This is this is old and this is something that um, belongs to like a whole whole different set of people. Yeah. yeah. I just sort of do what the story wants me to do. You know, I'm really rooted in like what, how to tell this story in the way that it, it what's its voice and what, you know, and that, that relationship with the page where like you have this idea and then you start, but then the page is like, no, -uh, that's not going to happen. I want to do this. Right. And so like this constant kind of conversation you're having with your work and your own mind. And it's quite trippy. It's amazing. And it yeah. comes out on the page that way. It does, you know, and I sew on my pages too, like when it needs to happen. I've put actual underwear in my book. There's a freaking pair of underwear in my book. I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Put in my scanner. 
Um, Dash, what about you and the way you've used color over the years? How has that evolved for you, or do you have you kept it kind of the same way? And, um, and also, from an animator standpoint, how do you look at this, and how has that changed the, things? The um, you know, I like like everyone here. I just, I I work practically basically, and and um, the I have my studio has these large magnet boards, so a lot of it is just me putting up, I'll draw, paint something, and then I'll put it up and I like having it there. You know, if it's, if it's, if it exists only on the computer, then you're only looking at it when you're working at, on it. And I think that can, that that's not good, that, that I want to be able to like have it just kind of floating in the background and I'll see, oh, maybe there should be some yellow there or something. And, and that um, space, um, is important. So they have to, everything kind of has to exist as an actual object. Um, you know, animation, a lot of like the backgrounds are painted, air, you know, airbrush, um, spray paint, sometimes cutting stencils, um, anything, anything, thing, things, uh, you know, with the book New School, the lines were drawn thick enough kind of like a coloring book line that they would remain legible with anything behind it, you know, a photo could, you could still follow the story. So I tried to um, monopolize, I guess, on that or take advantage of the thickness of the, of the lines of the comic to, to see how um, dissonant the color layer could be, um, you know, I, I, I remember thinking of it as like a, like a movie score, like, in like a Bernard Herrmann score is very loud and it's very abstract and it's in your face and you're very aware of it, um, but you 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 still know what's happening and it doesn't like it doesn't, um, you know it it's a it's a large abstract force that is like existing simultaneously to a more literal. Um, description of of the events of the story. And um, you touched on New School. And uh, when that came out, I was blown away because it was among the most aggressively experimental use of color I'd ever seen in a comic up to that point. Story. Um, there's, uh, there's a young man. He goes to this island um, to kind of trying to track down his brother um his brother's who, teaching english right at uh at at the at the school and it's it's a small island nation and on it they're opening this big theme park and when you say theme park you automatically think over the top colors over the top sensations and experiences um I read that he said initially the book was entirely in color, but you thought it looked made it look confusing. Um, so when color starts coming in uh, and it surrounds this main character, his name is Danny, when he gets there. Um, and uh, Danny's precognitive. So some of the colors signal, this is one of his precognitive dreams. Um, and one also gets a sense that this character is synesthetic. So this, he's experiencing the world, everything is a color, experiences are a color. And there's one point where um, he's running and the colors are alternating red and green, the colors of 3D. Um, and it, it's kind of mimicking that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, and then, and also colors also represent his emotional states, his feelings towards others. Um, and none of this is ever explicitly stated or explained in the book. It's just something that's happening. But again, if you're paying attention to detail, it's um, what's happening seems pretty clear. Um, you've always run on the side of being aggressively experimental in your comics one way or another. Um, what took you to the next level in your use of color from here from what you had been doing in your short stories? 
Uh, you know, the, the, the most on, the most honest <laughs> answer is that, uh, you know, bottom, I had done bottomless belly button and, and body world. And I had done those without having, um, without being aware that people would read them because I was young enough and I had, um, kind of, I hadn't had a publisher, you know, bottomless I finished and just kind of hand to fan graphics and they didn't um, respond for a long time. And so I started putting body world online. It was, it was even before Tumblr. Um, so there was a kind of uh, um, freedom, there was a, to a freedom in that, you know? And then um, New School was the first book that I did where I thought um, other people, where I was aware other people would read it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and Bottomless and Body World had done, like for, for me, the response was more than I could have ever dreamed. Like I, I, I reached my childhood dream very early there. So I, so I was on a, I was on cloud nine kind of very, very, I thought, you know, I can do anything. I'm, I, I had extreme, um, you know, mid twenties confidence. <laughs> when when making that, I was all shattered as I as I got older, all torn torn down as reality uh, reality intruded. Um, so the the so I think maybe it was kind of like um, just feeling like ex yeah, just confidence and exploring and 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 the kind of confidence I think is. Um, you know, a necessary kind of delusion or something to, to, you have to kind of protect it and maintain it because um, as you go. And then confidence itself, like on, on my animations, um, I, on, there's this actor, Thomas J. Ryan, who um, was in a lot of the experimental theater in New York, the, like the Richard Foreman plays. And it would be weird, you know, unusual stuff where he would have to like walk to one, side of a stage and lift one leg up to say one line and you know then put the leg down and walk to the other side and lift the other leg up to say the next part of the line and of course you know as an actor his thing was like well what's my motivation why am i you know why am i doing this while saying this line and uh and richard foreman said if, it, if you really believe that it's the only way you can say that line is if you lift your leg up while you're saying it then that that level of confidence will be transmitted to to us, you know. Um, so I think I think that's kind of um, I think that's kind of true in terms of experimental work. Um, in terms of thinking about this particular story, um, did you have things you know? Did you have things in mind regarding how you wanted the reader to interpret this? You know, did you? did you feel like you were successful in like, if a reader is paying close attention to my use of color, they'll understand the story? Um, you know, I actually, I, I don't think you have to pay that close attention to it because it's pretty in your face. And that was kind of the, the goal for that one. Um, but the, the, the thing that's great about color is you can read, you know, lots of books about color meaning and like, red looks at you and you look into blue and all of this stuff. Um, but uh, ultimately it's kind of experienced on a, on a non-literal um, level. So um, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think color coding will, it, well, it only take you so far. Right. Um, Tilly, I wanted to get back to, are you listening? where you talk about here, you're like, this is where I figured it out. Overlay. And this, exactly. And in this particular one, this is, um, it's a narrative of two women who are kind of, they're going on a journey. It's a road trip. It's a road trip story. It's also a story about people trying to figure out their traumas. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then there's a cat who may or may not be magical. Yeah. And then there are these sort of, um, looming um, state officials who are following them because they want this cat. 
and um there's like the 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 bureau they're from is like hilariously official it was a real bureau i found it it like existed for like five minutes in the 1920s of the office of road investigation i don't even remember what it was but yes yes and that was that was an amazing detail um because it, it may as well have been anything any kind of authority anything that was trying to snuff out something magical and um, was threatening and threatening women in particular. Um, but throughout the story, uh, which alternates between realism and magical realism, um, the use of color throughout is steady and is kind of the same where it's like when, when weird things start happening and magical roads start appearing, it's all in the context of the color we saw before. But these colors are like extremely vivid and the pinks, the purples, things like that. Uh, what was your process in crafting this emotional narrative? And to what degree did you think of color as sort of like um, an essential element of this? I think the color was essential. I think it's the only thing I've written where the color was actually extremely essential to me. Um, and it all started with my memories of driving through very desolate West Texas with my dad as a kid, like trying to visit relatives. And it always seemed like the drive lasted for a really long time at dawn and dusk, but in the middle of the day when it was like bright and sunny, it just like disappeared. And I started off trying, and in fact, the initial colors on the book, my, my publisher said they were almost too murky. Um, I, I wanted to capture this atmosphere of that time of day when everything is, is real, but it almost like a coin could flip and, and everything could change. Um, this very like sort of in-between space. Um, but more than that, I think, that was just a starting point. And it was, the color was a way to, to express the mood, which was obviously pretty grim in a lot of the book. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing the color did for me is I was embarking on making this book about something that I really didn't want to talk about and something that I still don't really want to talk about and that I won't talk about. And the color was a way to kind of express that tension, if that makes sense. I felt like mm -hmm. I was using the color to say everything that I did not want to put into words and that I didn't feel like it would be helpful to put into words. Right. Um, so the color almost is its own voice in the story. Um, and I colored it in such a state that I, I don't actually have much memory of coloring it. It's like, it's totally wiped clean from my brain. Um, but I think that's because I was, I was using the color to almost write, write a story on top of the story. Um, and it was grueling. And I don't know if I'll ever really do it again, but I'm, I'm still glad I did it. Did you find in writing this sort of like hidden narrative, was it, um, did you find it like a therapeutic or cathartic experience even if it was difficult or just sort of like, well, that was just tough and that's just the way it is? I don't know. You know, I I can never really tell where healing comes from. Maybe, um, maybe I it had a, it certainly had an effect on my life. Though I don't. It's it's very hard to trace. Um, I think, if anything, it it informed my process a lot, um, and that in itself is like is a very healing thing. Your process changes with you um, as you like grow and grow and change. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm very mixed on the whole like artist therapy thing. I think art is like kind of therapy, but also not at all. Um, not still not sure about it. <laughs> uh, that's fair. And, and Shira, for you, um, what did you have a connection between telling a story in color and telling a story in general uh, as like um, as a, as, an, as a cathartic experience and being in this kind of storytelling, especially after how long it took you to actually get it out. Yeah, I really relate to what you were saying, Tilly, that it's therapy, but not therapy. I think it's dangerous to say that we do this as therapy, but I think I've taught myself more in a way than all the therapy I've ever done. So it's a, it's a, it's a healing process, but like that, what you said about, you don't know where healing comes from feels very true to me too. Um, so yeah, it was super cathartic. I did a lot of, I worked out, a lot. for me it felt like burial ground and I was talking about stuff that people don't want I mean grief and um infertility 
death. That's all like taboo stuff in this world. People don't want to know from it. You get five business days and then you have to move on. <laughs> that never worked for me. And I, I think that that being in that, you know, navigating that tension of like having all of this, all these overlapping griefs and how sticky grief is, and then having nowhere to put it, my art became that safe place for me. And that's where I would, it would always be waiting. And much like textile work, it'd be waiting for me to pick it up and put it down. So the interruptions of being a mom and, you know, having to work day jobs, and it was always just there. And it was a place I could go um, and it's interesting too what you were saying, Dash, about people not reading, thinking that people aren't going to read your work and that safety and that freedom. So I had kind of all of that going on. Um, but yeah, I cried my way through a lot of the pages. And sometimes I would tear them, like I'd rip them or rip through them. And like sometimes the process of telling the story was was really physically apparent in the work that I was doing. So that's definitely a healing thing and a therapeutic thing, but not therapy. Uh and Mari, we're gonna we're gonna close with you and ask sort of a similar question from a different angle. Um, Life on Earth is about a group of teenagers, some of whom were very very close friends, and then those friendships became irreparably fractured. And then the book that you, uh, you sent me that you're sort of shopping around um, is about a really close friendship that became irreparably fractured. But then there's like so many unbelievable twists that happen later to it it's like you know it was easier to believe in the alien than the things <laughs> in that other story uh and and in color is a very important part of this new book in particular um given your background as a painter um and given um the the way you're experimenting with color now how important was it if you use color in this work to like get at the emotions in the story. Are you talking about life on earth? No, the new one. The new, oh, color was super, super important. Um, it's so funny because life on earth, like even though that's my newest book that I finished that years ago and I finished two books since then. And so whenever I, we're talking about color and I'm so, so far advanced from what, what you're seeing in my published work. And that's, that's, so frustrating with publishing because it's going to be years before anyone sees this but uh i feel like much like tilly like every every book or each even every small project i want to learn something new i want to try something different i just want to i just want to become a more interesting person just an artist definitely like i just uh, but because i get bored doing the same thing over and over again which is funny that i'm a cartoonist um <laughs> but I, I feel like I'm just <laughs> I, I'm just so into color right now, which is why it's it's funny that most of my stuff for you know 20 years is all black and white. Um, but even turning Japanese, like when I was conceptualizing it and and uh, and and coming up with a pitch, that was all in color. But then I was told like you know we, well we, we can't afford to do this in color. Um, or it made it so much harder to sell. So I just ended up doing it in black and white, but like I've been drawn to color for a long time. Uh, and and just like every every book or every, you know, a prose book or ev like everything, I, I want every line and every color and every just every panel to have a meaning. Like I don't want it to be filler. I don't want something to be there unless it has to be um, and I feel that way about color as well although I still read other people's comics who the color could maybe be there or not be there because visually I just I like to look at it um, so I don't think there's n it's not worth doing color if it doesn't mean something it means something to me as a reader even if it doesn't mean something to the narrative but um, but as as a creator I that's just what I like to do because I like to make my life hard, I guess. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a sentiment of all of you share, but the readers, <laughs> the readers greatly benefit from it. Um, that is about all the time we have uh, for this panel. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, I wanted to mention uh, Dash has a new movie out, CryptoZoo. Um, and it's just coming to theaters in the US now um, it's left right? the theaters. It's come and, come and gone. Is it coming to streaming soon? It's already, it's on streaming already. Oh, uh, what, uh, what networks? What, uh... On the, all the digital rental platforms on, yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, and then again, Tilly's uh, collection, um, <clears throat> uh, Alone in Space uh, from Avery Hill. Um, that was uh, that was her first publisher, and it's a lot of it's all of her early works put together, plus like drawings, sketches, things like that. Um, she wrote a brand new book again, Red Rock Baby Candy, and uh, Dash's um, sensational new book, Discipline, uh, which is about the experience of a Quaker Civil War soldier, um, done actually in the style of a lot of like um, black and white Civil War photographs taken from um, Dash did a lot of research on Civil War diaries and such. Not not the photographs, but the the they're called the specials, the Civil War era um, journalistic illustrators. But oh, okay, thank you, uh, thank, thank you. you for saying that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so again, that is uh, all of our time for today, and thanks to everyone. And um, hopefully next year, uh, when we have an actual SPX, we'll be able to see um, everyone in person. Thanks for your time. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Bye. Bye.